you that are looking for the Hairbrain Schemes Battletech video game. Great game. We've got it on pre-order. We'll be playing it soon, but that's not what we're doing here. This is the tabletop game that Battletech and also the MechWarrior franchises are derived from. So this is the original game. Uh, let's do some quick introductions, and then we'll get down to it. Though, one note, if you are hearing this on our uh, podcast stream, you're only hearing the MP3 side of this. There is a video side of this, so if you want to see the map combats and such, you can find that on YouTube, uh, the link to our YouTube channels off of feartheboot.com, or if you want to watch it live as we stream it on Twitch, you can also find that link off of feartheboot.com. So, let's do some quick introductions. So, my name is Dan. I'm uh, one of the hosts of the Fear the Boot role-playing game podcast. And the players that are joining me for this game, first up we got Johnny G. Hello. Another host from Fear the Boot, currently living in Jefferson City, so he's been on an extended hiatus from our roster. We got Chris Ings. And Chris here is, uh, so what are you exactly? You're, you're basically the Catalyst version of a press ganger. Uh, yeah, the Catalyst demo team, or CDT, is uh, just a group of people who like playing Catalyst games, Battletech, Shadowrun, family games, all kinds of other stuff, and um, we do demonstration games at uh, conventions, local hobby shops, um, spreading the word and having a lot of fun. Yeah, and Chris and I are going to make an interesting brain trust because uh, I worked on Battletech way back in its early days when it was still under the original FASA, not the new one, And but I kind of stopped following the game, whereas Chris kept following it. And so my knowledge of the old stuff and his knowledge of the new stuff uh, together is kind of going to be some crazy stuff. Uh, and by the way, we are going to be running Battletech with the role-playing game aspect. So if you think this is purely a board game, we're going to show you that it is also a role-playing game. And to keep it current, we're going to be using the A Time of War rules, which is the most recent edition of the MechWarrior role-playing game. And uh, for the sake of keeping the map combats relatively fast, instead of using the full Battletech rules, we will be using something called Alpha Strike, which has some mixed opinions amongst the Battletech grognards, but we just don't have time on a Monday night to be doing six-hour map combats. All right, so next up we got Mark Dino. Hi, everybody. Mark. Uh, I'm Mark. <laughs> What's your pedigree? Because... People in the role-playing community, they've even if they don't know your name, they know of something you've done. Uh, that's right. So I'm a freelance writer, and I helped uh, develop write on the Shadowrun 5th edition. I, did, I also wrote a little bit in 4th edition, but I was a, a more major, more significant contributor to Shadowrun 5th edition. And so the... For instance, if you see the uh, flip to the Game Master chapter in your Shadowrun 5th edition rulebook, that my my name is on the front of that chapter. So, and then we have our rounding error, George. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Hi. He's a very serious look on his face, though. Yeah, yeah he's the core of this operation. Jo George yeah. is the heart and soul of this operation. Oh, he, I wasn't gonna brag, but he's always good to go for a game. He's always got a simple club-shaped solution for everything. George was also... <laughs> a, he was a host on the Trapcast uh, tabletop gaming podcast, which is dead and gone, but uh, he did that. He's also always part of our ruckus crew at Gen Con. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, the yes. banner icon of our internal group for this organization is George reclining in the window of... Uh, the Geisha Sushi Restaurant in downtown Indianapolis. Mikado. On, on, oh, yeah, that's right, Mikado. On some long ago Gen Con afternoon. Yeah, what was the, what was the name of the guy who played uh, George Costanza on Seinfeld? Jason Alexander. Jason Alexander, because there's that poster of him like reclining yes. on a bearskin rug and underwear. It's, it's that pose. It's pretty much that pose. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's just as shocking to the brain. All right, so here's what we're going to do today. If you're wondering what kind of group we're playing or who the characters are going to be or anything like that, we don't know either. Uh, one of the things that we espouse on Fear the Boot is that if you want a game to go well, you've got to set it up for success, and that means doing some pre-game work or what we call session zero work. 
So stuff you do before game one to make sure you've got a good group of characters and everybody's on the same page about what this game is about. So that's where we're going to be today. I doubt we will get to any, really doubt we'll actually get to the game itself and may even not get to character creation until next time. But trust me, if you've never seen us go through this process, it's informative and it has helped us immensely with keeping our games alive and going a whole lot better and avoiding a whole lot of the dysfunction we've been plagued with over the years. All right, so let's start off with the basics here. Battletech, for anyone that doesn't know, is a game that exists in a whole bunch of eras of play where culture and technology change across all of them. And so in some it's very feudal, in some it feels more like modern military. Uh, there are factions that come and go and technology rises and falls. So we're going to start there. Does anyone have any first thoughts on the kind of character they want to play, era they want to play in, type of story they're looking for, just anything to get the discussion rolling on, you know, just to find a place to enter that circle? Well, as I've said before, I would like to do anything but the time period that we've done repeatedly before, which is the initial wave of the clan invasion. Uh, I'm not a particular clan lover or clan hater. Uh, I could do it when the clan war is in full speed. I could do it during the tenuous peace after Tukiyid. Uh I could do it all the way back in 2750. Um, so I'll... I'll throw that out there. I would generally lean a little bit towards the older tech, the 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 pre clan stuff, but that is a soft lean. I've actually never played once the the clan technology had more or less fully spread throughout the Indosphere and, and uh, Comstar had torn off the mask and, and started deploying massive amounts of mechs everywhere. So that could be cool too. Okay, um just uh, because you introduced me as being the one who knows the stuff after the clan invasion, uh, the period he's referring to of early clan invasion is anything from 3049 all the way up to uh, 3051, 3052, right after Tukia. Um If you're talking about the time when clan technology had actually started like diasporing through the inner sphere, that'd be any time after Operation Bird Dog and Bulldog in 3067. Um, Oh, sorry, 3061, excuse me. 3061 was that. 3067 is the beginning of the jihad period um, when Comstar goes nuts and then decides to just start um, tearing tearing us through the atmosphere. Um, I have character ideas for, like, all across the board, which is uh, when I messaged earlier, it was about... Um, you know, trying to get an idea, but it really depends on the time period because there's good stuff all over the place. Just any one of these eras has a whole bunch of neat stuff, which is one of the cool things about Battletech. I think the three eras that I am probably most comfortable running in terms of I grok what's going on, um, if we take the early clan invasion off the table, would be the 3025 or the traditional Succession Wars era. Uh, they're called the Succession Wars when it was not into Battletech because there was a sort of galaxy-spanning empire. Well, I say galaxy-spanning. It spanned occupied space uh, that imploded without a clear successor. And so there were wars of succession uh, amongst the sort of next tier down on the feudal ladder for who was going to be the next ruler. So that's kind of the 3025 era. Uh, I could kick that forward a bit if you want to up the tech and change the politics to the like War of 3039 stuff, uh, which was smaller than Succession Wars, but was still a pretty large-scale war, and also saw the early introduction of some technologies that didn't stick around, and some that did, because uh, by then they were starting to recover some of the Star League technology. Uh, and I would also be fine, John, with running anything uh, that occurs <coughs> Excuse me, uh, between... The battle took Eid and the start of the Twilight of the Clans. So something, let's say, 3052 to 3055 sort of era. Of those, the most exciting to me would be the straight-up OG Succession Wars, since that's kind of the original Battletech, and I've never played in it. Uh, but I'm good with all that. 
Chris, Mark, George, and by the way, uh, Mark has some family stuff to attend to, so there may be points where he's gone from his camera, which anyone listening on the audio won't even notice, but it's my understanding his headset is Bluetooth, so he will still be in on the conversation, uh, though he may get distracted from time to time, but that's okay, because real life comes first, it's just a game, so. Um, for me, I started Battletech as a clan player, so... That's that's yeah. my personal heresy. Right as far as and drop. Is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I said, I'm I'm good at any one of the individual levels. I have played um, BattleTech in every era. Um, if um, if we did clan era, uh, and I don't say this to entice you to anything, this is just GM commentary. If we did clan era. I would allow you to play uh, someone that they had bonded. So, uh, also, but I'll give a little bit of side story here for anyone who's not up on their battle tech. The clans have a society where if a warrior is defeated in battle, they can be taken as a bondsman, or basically they are something of a servant or a, an underling to a patron soldier who is rehabilitating them to either re enter as a combatant, or to be uh, released and sent back home. Uh, you know, I believe they based that on, like, uh, Mongol tradition with... Uh, oh, yeah, it's quite real. Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite real. It, it, it's, it yeah, has... They, the Khans are Genghis Khan. Like, yeah. The yeah. clans and, are Mongols. Uh, a, a, a clan meeting is also called a curl tie, so, yeah, it's very Mongolian. Yeah, I mean, and so, yeah, the, the bondsman, it absolutely has a basis in history. Um, in fact, actually, the entire history of Battletech is pretty much the uh, a crash course through uh, Eurasian history, because the Star League was the Roman Empire, um, or the Greeks' uh, Comstar was the Catholic Church, etc., etc. I will say this. I would really dig a 3055 um scenario or thirty fifty five campaign around that era because like one of the best books was uh, Mercenary's Handbook thirty fifty five with that great cover art and uh just set on outreach and that is a, a uniquely uh interesting uh time period and setting and uh, that would be really cool. That'd be uh that'd be neat. I I've, I've actually played the fewest games in that year in that particular time period. Um mostly because a lot of people want to go either all the way back. Um, so my vote would be for that. Or I would also uh, be interested in like going back OG Star League and doing something in the 2750s. That'd be interesting. I would actually second the uh, 3055. Uh, I was eyeballing any year after 52... Just because I kind of already have like a general idea of the kind of guy I want to be, post thirty fifty two would give him some some slightly more interesting background. All right, so it sounds like we're leaning towards a thirty fifty two to thirty fifty five. So yes, post took uh, So far, that's at least gotten general approval from everyone, and some what sounds like some strong nods from two of you guys. Mark, are you still on mic? Okay, Mark may be off mic, so we'll just go ahead then and we'll push forward with that. Okay, so does anyone want to express a veto to a 3052 to 3055, sorry, post tookie id but pre-Twilight of the Clans era of play? So the, the that sounds good to me. Okay, so the Clans have invaded, they have been stalemated. Uh, at Tukia, their invasion has been stalled, but they have not yet really started getting uh, integrated socially or disintegrated militarily. So, yes, they are trying to consolidate their holdings. There's quite a few uh, interclan clan um, problems at this particular point. The um, Falcon Wolf War takes place during this era. Um, the um, Red Corsair raids take place during this era. Um, the clans are doing a lot of stuff to try and repudiate the truce so they can resume the attacks on the Inner Sphere. 
Yeah, because clans have a generational turnover that's very short, whereas uh, we in normal society think of a generation as taking about 20 to 25 years to occur. Uh, they have a generational turnover of about oh, five years. Oh, uh, so they actually described a few of the books as short as five years uh, during the debate between Anastasius Falked and uh, Kerensky. Uh, he described it as three generations so in a 15-year truce. So, but whether it's five years, ten years, however you want to describe it, the point being that this is there are whole well, there are whole generations of warriors in a warrior society that will never have a chance to fight. And that's a huge cultural issue for them. Yeah, I take a warden view of the time, and uh, the five-year mark is more of a crusader view, which is it gets a political division within the clans, but yeah. Yeah, and for anyone who's getting lost in all these proper nouns and concepts, just stick with us. The ones we don't define, you'll catch by context and further explanation along the way. All right, so we're going to go with a 3052 to 3055 era of play. I will tell you straight up my rule for running Battletech in pretty much any game is I will follow canon up to day one of the game, and at that point anything and everything is on table. So that means I can change the canon, and that means you guys can also, by your actions, change the canon. So there are no holy grails, there are no guaranteed events. Um, I will take this campaign, I don't know, maybe keep it where it belongs, or maybe take it way off the rails of where... FASA and Catalyst wrote where it went. That's the most fun. <laughs> what is? <laughs> it's absolutely the most fun. The greatest thing is always saying what if and then saying what next. Yeah, exactly. And I, I hate being a slave to someone else's untouchable stuff, you know. That, well, you can't do this because that's not how it happens in the books. And it's like, well, I don't really care. <laughs> it's, if you want to read the books, read the books. This isn't that story. This is the story of these characters. And they may do something that changes things, or I may have a plot that changes things. Got my vote. Okay, so next let's talk, what do you guys want to talk? Do you want to talk character concepts? Do you want to talk group concept? I think group concept is like an overarching idea that everyone else can try and get um, can create characters around or characters that will fit into that. So that's where I would go next, but you guys actually have more experience in this than I do. Okay. I do group first. All right. Let me give you, then, generally speaking, five types of groups uh, that, I, that we're going to pick from, or we're going to kick around. And these are going to go from, uh, we're going to be kind of in a more or less descending order of loyalties here. So the first is regulars. And what regulars are is regulars are the standing army of one of the powers of the inner sphere. Uh, now we can pick which one later, but a, a, within a regular campaign, you will exist within a military order. Now that military order does exist within a feudal concept still, or construct. So there are upward built loyalties as opposed to a top-down nation state in most cases. But nonetheless, you guys are under somebody's specific flag and are taking direct orders and whatever from a one of the powers. And the upside to this for you guys uh, is going to be that you're going to have a lot more resources and a lot more support. The downside is, of course, you as a group will have a little bit less freedom in terms of where you go and what you do. So... The second one down from that is Irregulars. What Irregulars are is they are a unit that works in tandem with one of the powers, even though they themselves aren't technically part of that house. So these are kind of like mercenaries that are on a permanent payroll. Uh, you can think of them. I guess the best modern-day comparison I could give you uh, would be something like uh, paramilitary corporations or something like that. Uh, but these are organizations that effectively fly someone's flag, but don't technically fly someone's flag. This yeah, is most. Uh, oh, sorry. Go, um, go ahead. I keep on jumping in with like little bit of world tidbits. Um, those are most like those are most often. Um, mercenary units with either a long history with a specific house or mercenaries that have fallen to the company store where they are simply so far indebted to their patron house that they 
pretty much can't escape and become another house unit. This was very common back in the 3025 era, and as things continued, um, a lot of these uh, larger Merc units that had gotten into that situation were basically indistinguishable from house units except having some of their own unique traditions. Yeah, great example of this would be the Kellhounds, which... Uh, they made sure, the House Steiner in particular, made sure that they would never break that contract uh, by giving them their own planet and looping them into the feudal politics. And uh, there are other examples too. But uh, they were technically mercenaries, but only on paper. All right, so the, these next ones, I, I guess they're fairly, I guess well, in terms of loyalty, the next one down, I would go with Partisans. So partisans, these are going to be individuals probably behind clan lines uh, who are, are or were part of one of the great powers and are now working independently uh, to try and win freedom or do maybe they simply are doing uh, black ops or spec ops or something like that. But these are individuals that are fighting a partisan or resistance war. One step down from them in terms of loyalty is mercenaries exactly fully independent mercs uh you guys have your own budget take your own contracts and if you get screwed there is nobody there to bail you out unless you've made some good friends along the way and then the lowest here in terms of loyalty and support but highest in terms of freedom is outright pirates as in r as in r yes pirates with an r <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, with Mercs, you can you can get a little bit of uh, leeway here and there. You, um, the big kind of asterisk with mercenary units is, of course, especially in this era that we're discussing, Wolf's Dragoons, um, because they are, the, at this point in the story, the largest and most powerful mercenary unit in the inner sphere for a variety of reasons which have become uh, somewhat public knowledge by this point by around 3052 or 3053, um, that the Dragoons have revealed their quasi-clan origins um, to a select number of people, and so rumors abound that they are. But um, they were very unique when they came into the Inner Sphere as not falling into that trap of company store, and as part of their original mission, working for all of the great houses because their original intent was to gather intelligence. Um, at this point in the story, though, they reveal their true orders, which was to defend the Inner Sphere from the clans. Yes. Well, and the Wolstergrins at this point, they have now, because Comstar has become, uh, they no longer a truly independent organization the way they had at least pretended to be for so long. Uh, they do not have as strong of a role in terms of bonding mercenaries as they once did. There That's is a taken over. Yep. yeah, there oh, is sorry. a location called the Mercenary Star, a planet called Galatea, that does still exist and is still used, but it is considered the uh, second class place to get your mercenary bonding and to uh, have your contracts held in, in escrow and things like that to the Wolster Goon's own planet of outreach. But so that if you guys go mercenaries, that will be a choice. Is do you want to operate, you know, really in the mainstream and high fashion, or do you want to be a little bit more rough around the edges and still be operating out of Galatea? For my own preferences, I would say irregulars sound fun. Never done that before. Uh, going back to what I've done to death as a pivot point to talk about what I would like to do, uh, I've done mercenaries many, many times. Uh, every full-length campaign I've played in has been a mercenary campaign. Uh, so going regular or even totally house army sound attractive to me at this point. There is also the straight-up pirate campaign. Uh, I didn't sit down thinking that would be on the table, but... As long as we weren't just mustache twirling buttholes and we're actually like, you know, a lance that was so dispossessed by the clan invasion or the fall of Rasalhag or something that uh, not only were we cut off from our ordinary feudal lords, but we were cut off from everything. Uh, that could be cool too. Yeah, and with pirates, I, let me stress here that precisely the type of pirates you are would also be something that you could decide. So precisely, I mean, are you evil? Do you are you more like 
stand and deliver thieves with honor sort of people, you know, you have your own code of ethics and rules, or are you maybe not even true pirates? Are you just something like a truly independent uh, army that doesn't really exist within the boundaries of society? You're something like salvage hunters. Or, or are we chartered? Uh, that uh, you could be uh, uh, even corporate uh, a, a corporation's private group or something like that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when, when I said there pirates is like There is like a little story tidbit in this. Uh, during this period, there is a great deal of interest on finding the Exodus Road, which is the path to the clan homeworlds. This is something that begins right after Tukid. Um, Interstellar Expeditions is a uh, corporation in the inner sphere that is across several of the great houses, and they fund many uh, expeditions to both look for abandoned Star League outposts and to see if they can uh, uh, find any trace. Uh, It's very dangerous work because it's operating uh, in the clan occupation zones in the periphery. But uh, ultimately it pays well. And another option along those lines, if you wanted to go that sort of thing but play a different spin is uh, if you are regulars of Comstar, uh, they also operate and have been operating for some time something called the Explorer Corps, which is doing much the same work, but under a far more specific flag. Uh, but yeah, if you if you want pirates or something, and we'll call them pirates, but these are more just fully independent soldiers of fortune, even more independent than mercenaries. You could be treasure hunters, you could be uh, prospectors, you could be... Uh, yeah, who knows? Any number of things. Once again, even some corporations, some of the larger corporations, actually have their own uh, standing paramilitaries. So you could be part of one of those. So I guess, I'm up for co- corporate paramilitary, up to and including Comstar and the other stuff too. The other ideas. Basically, all of those pirate proposals, other than black flag, shiver me timbers, give me your money, or I'll shoot you, sound like fun to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and I would say if we go that route, I would cert- uh, any of the pirate routes, there would certainly be a big question that I would have, um, but we'll get to that if we pick that. So let's run down the list again. So regulars, irregulars, partisans, mercenaries, and we'll put pirates in quote because they are pirates or fully independent forces. So does anyone have any yays, nays, anything they want to vote for, or flat veto off the table? I have never actually played a house unit, so that would be weird. I have never actually played a house unit either. I would, I would, the, the more we talk about it, the two things that sound the most fun to me are straight up uniform regular army and pirate corporate force explorer, comstar, whatever. The number one and number five Okay, so from John, I got to vote for one and five. Chris, where's where are you at? Yeah, I could also give a vote for one. Um, I always like playing Mercs, but I know that a lot of other people have played that, and I can play Mercs uh, a lot of other times. It's um, the thing about Mercs and independent formations is it gives uh, the most freedom to the campaign. Uh, it can go in the most places and do the most weird things. Um, although it's always possible to detach a house unit for some weird mission or whatnot, you never know what happens, especially during the clan raiding period. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, be interesting. So is this another one in five? Um, I think like uh, one and four, with the caveat of four being very similar. Like, I actually would take a crack at being Wolf's Dragoons. Uh, that'd be interesting for me. I haven't actually played, I've always played independent commands and not one of the major, which is like, it's a combination of being a house unit and having some freedom as a merc, because you can take the greater merc unit anywhere, but you are still a part of a much larger whole. Right, I mean, at some point, if if your merc band is so big that you've got a patch on your shoulder and you're taking orders from 19 levels of superiors anyway, you're, you're kind of back to being a regular. It yeah. just provides a more narrative. Well, not more. Well, there, there are plenty of things you can do. The, yeah, see, it, both of you are correct. Yes, you would be taking. I, I think in some ways it would feel much like a regulars' campaign in that 
there would be a very big structure of command you'd fit into. I think if nothing else, though, the mercenary, at least, depending on which mercenary corps we went with, could have a diversity of allegiances. And so, therefore, you could find yourself on multiple sides of conflicts. Um, and, I mean, not simultaneously, but, I mean, over time. And so, there would be some, some travel in there. Some freedom. George, where's your head at? I was actually over at Partisan, just because... Uh, I was eyeballing uh, a Curita character at an invasion, I think, in nineteen or 3052. So, like, wherever he was, he might be fighting the clan. That being said, could also do... Uh, regular and piracy are my number two tie. Piracy being the quote-unquote piracy. Okay, so the three we've got is regulars, with one possibility of the regulars being a mercenary group instead of one of the political powers. Partisans, and something fully independent, so pirates et alia. Does anyone want to veto or make a case against any of those three? I do not. I think all of those could work. What are you leaning toward, Dan? You're the GM. Uh, I will tell you in a moment, but let, let me get past these first. Uh, well, at least make sure you guys are are on are on page together. The completely independent, like by the skin of our teeth, pirates kind of thing out in the middle of nowhere is going to be like playing without a net. And I can see that really appealing to John. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be... I, I think I'll be the most challenging. Um, I, nah, I can't give a veto to any of them. They all, have, they all have appeals for me. John, George, is there anything... And Mark, if you've got your headset back, is there anything that you guys want to veto out of those three? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, even of the of the broad five, uh, there's there's nothing I would veto. My my plus signs go by number one and number five, but they are not uh, do this or I walk. I don't think anybody's at that point, but no, yes, I uh... hope not. <laughs> We're off to a bad start if we've got that already. Yes. George, what do you think? I I think. A regulars game would have one advantage in that uh, we've got the five new guys. Like, the group itself is new from a meta standpoint. A structured game would give us a certain degree of structure. It'll maybe let us... Give us enough direction that maybe we wouldn't be worrying about what to do, and maybe we would uh, be able to focus a little more on how we act. The only counterpoint, the only counterpoint I would make to that is, and this is something I just thought of, an actual house unit is going to place some, not a whole bunch, but more than any of the others, restrictions on character backgrounds and on uh, things that would make sense. Any uh, house military unit, like if before you, they are going to issue somebody weapons or anything, typically there's some kind of background check that's done, and you have to be a citizen, or there has to be some other program involved, and um, that might discourage some of the wilder character concepts people might have, whereas a completely independent to command tossed together out of a hodgepodge or a large mercenary unit uh, would also uh, be drawing... Um, personnel from a wide variety of places where an actual house unit would be um, drawing from a still broad but narrower pool. Let me throw in one, uh, I'll give you my caveat now on the fully independent thing. I have to know that there is something that motivates you guys beyond a single narrow goal. Okay, so if you guys are pirates, for example, I'd want to know that you are not solely motivated by wealth, because otherwise the campaign gets 
pretty monotone pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Same thing, if you're on like an exploratory thing, I'd have to know that you guys have some a diversity of interests out there. That the Exodus Road might be one of your interests. Finding the old Starling caches might be an interest. Uh, you know, there, there are other things. It, maybe even you have uh, some kind of political allegiance, uh, and so you're trying to sabotage uh, competing teams or something. I, I don't oh, know yeah, what, but I would. Have... I think the number five would provide a greater opportunity for diversity, both individually and in combination, than number one. Because if we go with number one, our motivation is set. It's uh, we all grew up. We went to military school, and now we are following orders because this is what we do. Whereas, if we're like expeditionary com guards or something, or or the uh, last remnant of the cadet branch of some minor family that had a periphery planet that just got totally cut off and wiped off the structure, we could bring more individual threads to that weave. Could you combine one and five and have like that as regulars, but got cut off, and now you're pirates to survive, and the couple rogue characters that you picked up, almost like a Firefly meets Mech Warrior kind of. I think we could, but I think the problem with that is it's too easily solvable. Uh, all we would need to do would be get the phone back on and call Korea to headquarters and, well, we're back on the team. All right. I Five would let everyone be what they want as opposed to... I think if... The extremes, I think I pick five then just so that everyone can have their own character and not feel... Uh, uh, close okay. to so between one and five, George. Unless, you... yeah, I'll go five. You go five, Chris. One or five? Oh. Yeah. All right. I guess I can go five. Yeah. Yeah. John? It's not. You're not twisting my arm. Five, sure. Okay, five it is. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with... Uh, do you guys want to... You know what? Let's work through... I've got two documents here we're going to work through. Uh, the first one's just a handful of quick questions to make sure we understand the tone of the game that we're all agreeing to. And then we'll actually do the group template and figure out what kind of group you guys are. So let's start with this. Um, are there any particular subjects you want this game to deal with that you would think would really add to your enjoyment? This is what you want out of a Battletech Mech Warrior game. Any particular themes, places, factions, types of NPCs, types of stories? And if the answer is no, the answer is no. But if you've got something, now's the time to tell me. I like Hunchback map combat. <laughs> I don't care if they have Hunchback 2Cs, George. But, uh... <laughs> I I, uh, I think a lot of Battletech GMs are, are worried that they're going to have too much map. Uh, don't worry about that with me. I love the map. That's that's my broad uh, broad piece of insight on this question. Well, with Alpha Strike, you can get plenty of it. I've never played Alpha Strike, so this will be just nice just beware. Um, it really turns up combat lethality. You lose mechs oh, a lot no. faster in uh, Alpha Strike. Losing mechs creates plot. <laughs> it does. Or if we decide, you know what, depending on how what we end up making exactly, we could go back to regular battle tech uh, if we find that the combats tend to be low scale or small in scale and lighter on the weight end, uh, such that the combats would not be six hour ordeals. Then we can. Yeah, always... we're probably not going to have a full lance of hundred. Hunters. Yeah. So, I mean, we could always opt to go back to full battle tech from Alpha Strike. So, we can play that one by ear. Okay, so, uh, anything else? What else do you guys want to... What else do you really want to see out of this campaign? I actually really liked Chris's idea. I didn't know about the whole... Uh, finding the... Uh, Exodus Road? 
Yeah. Yeah, so what the actual... Yeah, I like that too. Okay. You know, something else I'll put in is I want a little taste of Braddock missing in action. I want uh, to raid behind clan lines, pick up uh, POWs, um, be a thorn in their side while we're just running around, drive them nuts, especially when they are uh, more worried about uh, raiding each other and trying to find ways back into the inner sphere and trying to hunt we us could, down. We could be like an inner sphere battle tech version of A Team, where we're like against the clans, but like also yeah, irregular operations like that. And uh, it's very, very dangerous work. But uh, we could also start off. Um, there is one place in particular, Wolcott, in uh, the Draconis Combine um, during this period. Actually, one of the novels uh, tackles this um, particular thing. I think, believe it's a DRT. Um, and that takes place during the same era. It, uh, because of a quirk of uh, clan bidding, um, the clans are uh, honor-bound to never invade the planet again because it was a, uh, a condition of them not being able to take it originally. That sounds good to me, Chris. That sets up Wardens versus whatever the hell the other ones are. Crusaders Wardens versus, versus Crusaders. us versus the farmers that have a bunch of AK-47s. That'll be delightful. <laughs> so a lot of pirate points, a lot of sneaking around, a lot of running from superior clan technology and firepower, trying to steal some of it for ourselves. So All to, kinds of good stuff. So to explain the two things that were just mentioned to anyone who's not up on the proper nouns, uh, how the clans got formed is when the Star League collapsed, so basically the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, when everything gets divvied up, the main military, not wanting to be drawn into this, simply left to get out of the way of the war. And they went off into unknown space and found new planets to settle. The route they took is called the Exodus Road, and they have kept it carefully concealed from anyone. In fact, even most of them, like by most, I mean 99.99% of the clans, do not know their own Exodus Road. Uh, they learn it only in pieces so that nobody can learn the whole thing. And the captain of a warship gets a piece. And what happens... Uh, is once they get out to the end of the Exodus Road, that society also collapses, and then out of that comes the clans. And then the clans follow the Exodus Road back and invade the Inner Sphere, but since the Inner Sphere, which is everybody else, doesn't know where the clans come from, they can't counter-invade them. And so at this point in history, there's a real interest in any clue as to where the clans came from. Um, so, okay, so we've got map combats, there's interest in the Exodus Road... Uh, raiding behind lines. Uh, oh, the planet of Walcott. They, the clans have a very strict bidding system where they lay out, this is the invading force, this is the attacking force, uh, this is what's on the line if one side wins, and the inner sphere pulled off a, an underdog victory there and made as a condition of the, the engagement that if they won there, the clans would never come back to that planet. And they did win, and so the clans were never able to go back to that planet. So there's a lot of shenanigans going on for Walcott because it's untouchable. It's blockaded pretty well, but they cannot land there. So anything else? Map combats, Exodus Road, raiding behind the lines, any other things you guys want to see explored or dealt with in this game? Nope. Okay. Uh, next question. I don't think this one's going to be as pertinent to Battletech as it was to Skies of Glass because it's a this is a far less brutal setting. Um, but outside of really gratuitous violence, torture, rape, the kinds of things I'm not really interested in dealing with anyway, is there anything you specifically want the game to avoid? Hmm. I don't want to play a bad, bad guy or someone working for a bad, bad organization. Uh, but other than that, no. I, I trust your discretion. I have no interest in extremely grisly or salacious gaming content. But I've gamed with you for over a decade now, Dan, and I know you don't either. 
Yeah, and it, it doesn't really fit into the field of Battletech anyway. Like I said, I could have seen it coming up in... Or... There are some places of existential horror that can come up, in the, especially when it comes to weapons of mass destruction and desperate people uh, in this particular setting. It's, it's a trope that comes up a couple of times. And some of those concepts might be interesting to work with, where so far as you are attempting to stop weapons of mass destruction from being used on a um, planetary scale. That might be interesting. But yes, for the most part, it don't need to delve too deep into the dark side of human emotion. Uh, is there anything you want the game to avoid, not for reasons of personal revulsion, but just because you just don't find it interesting. Uh, a, a rule that annoys you, a theme, uh, not a theme, but a uh, type of story or something. Just well, let's get anything other than the obvious. If there's. No, I will express some preliminary willingness to do the full version of the rules, even if it takes us, you know, breaking up sessions and whatnot. Um, but. We can try the quick version too. I've never played. And kids on the camera. Yeah, we have a visitor on the camera. So, okay. So I will put simply nothing for this. I'll say. Um, oh, go ahead. No, I, I like what John brought up. Um, like high lethality. And that down just or or have a measure. I I do want our characters to have consequences uh and what i would want to avoid is a problem i've encountered in some of my games where it's not character it's not character death it's character in that you become mechless and become essentially ineffective in entire session of a six session game uh i mean i'm not saying like to throw our mech in front of a atlas and try and punch it in the face and then you know and like there does need there to say is I mean even just an aerospace some kind of I don't know some kind of uh what's the word of John what what's what am I looking for here? I don't wanna Save or suck, like that. The, aver the BattleTech version of that. So, so is basically what you're looking for is you want a game that has meaningful consequences without being per benched or punished. I mean, I'll take death over and reroll over. <laughs> death over dispossession. <laughs> yeah. It's not just a slogan anymore. <laughs> no, I get what you're saying, though. Like. It's better to just die and come back with George to than to be the guy who has to write a half track now because someone rolled a critical on your ammo section. Okay. I will yes. rock vehicles. I will rock your boxers off with vehicles. Oh yeah, no, I love vehicles too. I mean, I I think I had a character wind up getting his crap blown up all the way down to flying a helicopter for a little while. But uh, I understand what George is saying. And Dan, as always, I I oh, no. Do not mind Session I want all the rules against me to be done on the table, and if I blow up, I blow up. Well, that is my next one down, is PC death. Yes, no. Yes. Y yes for if, some people, no for others. If it happens, if it happens, it happens. You try your best to make sure it doesn't happen. Agreed. Life if the rules are fair and on the open, and uh, it happens, then that's, that's the risk. Mark PC death, yes or no. Um, conditionally? <laughs> what's, what's the condition? Uh, I don't enjoy it if it is just a series of really poor luck and then the character dies in an incredibly unexpected or undramatic way. That sort of thing. That's fair. Battletech, um, and Chris, you can help me out here because you know the Time of War rules better that I do. Uh, did the Time of War keep Edge? Oh yeah, Edge is still in there. Outstanding, okay. So, but yeah, Mark, there is a concept in Battletech that is... It works somewhat akin to the Karma system that has traditionally been around Shadowrun, where you will get a set number of rerolls per game uh, to help you 
well, edge some of that from, away from happening. But yeah, I, I also, I'm of the same mind that there's a big difference, let's use a D&D example here, between your character dying in a meaningful way and your character just happening to fall down because three goblins got lucky hits. Mm-hmm. Um, so I will put uh, PC Death here and I'll put uh, ES uh, with some player reservations. And actually the only campaign recently in Battletech where I had a player character die, I asked them. That was Wayne. It was Wayne. I actually asked Wayne, I said, are you okay with this? Do you want me to find some excuse to not kill you? Uh, You know, there's going to be consequences here. So otherwise, what's the point? But, um, okay. Chris, does does the edge function like Shadowrun's edge? It is not identical to Shadowrun's Edge. These concepts are similar, but not the same. The, the way Edge works in uh, the Mech Warrior sus- system is uh, you are allowed to just either uh, flat re-roll a die roll, or if it's a roll against you, you may ask me to re-roll a die roll. That's the way it works in the Belltech tabletop. In, my, in a Time of War, it is slightly different, but... Uh, think that's best covered like we can um if people are getting used to the system and whatnot that can be covered uh in depth uh probably at another time it's probably gonna get closer to actually playing because that's like more mechanics okay is there anything that i want from you guys the main thing that i need from you guys is active participation uh because there are uh four players and there's going to be some interruptions, uh, you know, certainly for Mark. I know at times uh, George has Miranda invasions and whatnot. You know, I know stuff's going to come up. Uh, the main thing I need from you guys is to, uh, I'll give you stuff to do. I just need you guys to not sit there and stare at me. I don't think that's going to be, a, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um... I think we've already talked about this. It's kind of redundant, so I'm putting it in next to that one. Uh, okay, last question on that one before we actually start designing the group. So this is all the metagame stuff. We'll actually get to the game stuff next. Is there anything you guys want from each other? Is there any requests you have for the other players that you want them to do something or not do something? I would say general harmony within the PC organization is better than not 99% of the time, but I think most people agree. John, yeah, I, mean, I am going to ask you if you want to have a slight love-hate relationship with... If you, do, you, do you still want to... Do you want to do... Oh, absolutely. We can, okay. we can mold... Shiro Hasegawa and Antonio Antonelli as they developed as penguins when we played Solaris. Okay. So you love and hate the penguins as you love and hate yourselves. Exactly. <laughs> okay. No, I, I think they both love themselves just fine. It's just the other guy that is an inscrutable yeah. a-hole. Yeah. <laughs> Shit he pulls. Okay. Let's talk actual I, get- I agree. So I'll add something here. Oh, go ahead. General go ahead. harmony. Yeah. General harmony within the within the group is good. I, I think as we design the group, finding reasons to to be together, that bonding agent will be good. Okay. Um, but of course, we can design interpersonal conflict because that just makes things interesting. And then the the general improv rule of the the yes and right. So when when players throw out you know little interactions and plot hooks and things like that, it. Uh, it works best to just pick up on them and and roll with it, right? So I'm, I've always enjoyed my sessions best where uh, if I, say, throw out something that we haven't pre-planned, you know, like John's character, I say to John's character something like, uh, oh, yeah, this is exactly like, uh, you know, that time when we you know, met those girls on that, that last planet and it all went wrong. Do you remember that one? Or, or remember when you totally flubbed that other thing, you know, to have a character... To, for you to pick up on that and then just enroll with it rather than uh, kind of like, no, no, my character wouldn't do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I... Uh... And, and I'm fine with that as well as a game master uh, provided, like, it's not... It, Chad in particular takes a lot of leeway with just kind of throwing out random stuff like 
uh, I don't know, the group will be in a bar and he'll be like, you know, since the bartender and I go way back or something like that, and I'm okay with that as long as it's not plot altering. Um, oh yeah, I love that stuff. There is one other thing I'm going to want from you guys, and I, I went back and added this to the little thing I'm taking notes on, which is I will want each of you to give me two or three plot hooks that I can opt to work with uh, to personalize the game. So this can be anything you come up with. Uh, so this can be there's a particular thing you're looking for, uh, there's a an image you're trying to live up to, there's someone you're trying to get revenge against, there's a debt you owe. I don't care what it is, but give me something that I can use in the plot. Uh, you have a rival. I don't know. Maybe you have a friend out there. Whatever it is. I don't care. But just something that I can use as a plot element uh, to personalize uh, what's going on to your individual characters. Do you want more than three? Because that guy can do a lot more. Oh, you give me 25 of them. I may only use two or three, but I, I won't stop you from giving me <laughs> sh- loads of them. Um, in fact, Chris, I'm gonna, I have a particular proposal for your character that we'll come back to here in a moment. Okay, so... Um, does the Game Master need our... Uh, we're now on to the actual game contents. So, does the gr- Game Master need our group to be something particular for his or her plot? No. We've already covered that. Uh, in brief, what will our group be when the game starts? Okay, so now we get down to it. What exactly are you? Who exactly do you work for? If anyone. At the moment the game starts. I mean, this this can be in flux. So, we talked about being a... Mer- a- pirate, quote-unquote, band, um, which is basically just a dirty way of saying an independent mercenary unit, because that's really what they are, but they're not um, not registered or bonded with the MRBC or Outreach um, or um, the old Mercenary Review Board. Um, so basically, it's just a collection of uh, personnel and equipment with some loose uh, military-esque structure um, with trying to accomplish specific goals. Is that pretty sum up for everybody? Yes. Uh, do you have any preference on who's footing your bill? Um, oh, what's the I bear's... Would... We have a bear now. What's the bear's name? <laughs> Brownie, I believe, is the bear's name. You don't know? You should... <laughs> for those of you not watching a video feed, Mark's daughter is uh, having a bear interact with us, stuffed bear. So, we have Brownie or, now. Or I would, uh, might be putting the bill, it could be anybody from Comstar to House Karita to uh, anybody who's actually being invaded by the clans. At this point, there is also a sliver of the free Russell Hague Republic left, uh, and uh, they love anything that gives the clans a hard time. Um... And so they might also be uh, occasionally bankrolling us, and they would be would not put it past them to hire whoever they could get, as long as they point them at the clans and say, "Go make, go cause a ruckus." You know, something that'd be kind of fun. I think I would have fun with if you guys don't object. Do you mind if you're uh, while you are you're certainly given dispensation to do what you're doing by your fellow forces doing similar things? So you have a positive working relationship with House Curita, with Comstar, etc., etc., that you are directly bankrolled by, shall we say, a philanthropist, basically somebody who has an axe to grind, and, uh... There are many of them. Chandra Sagar Curita, among others, is a, a very wealthy person in the Draconis Combine who does all kinds of this stuff throughout the Battletech timeline. Oh, I'll be making uh, my own. I'm just asking if in I'm just, I was providing a, an example that exists in the universe. And I, w- I would not use this character to uh, micromanage you guys. But... Yeah, that sounds good to me. I'd just like uh, to put... Uh, I, sorry, I just think it'd be fun to put a personal face to it. That it's not an organization, it's a who. Oh yeah, like a, a, a Jarl from the Free Russellhead Republic. That'd be great. Yeah, that's yeah. Just... I like I like uh, an FRR. Like they knocked me off my planet, but I still have billions of sea bills in electronic storage and yeah, can they be in a circuit? So them? like the the clans couldn't take that with their mix or Comstar. And we've we've tossed about more or less having the check show up out of nowhere from your local. AT&T station slash cathedral. Um, 
And that sounds fun too. Mm -hmm. But I'm all about Rasol Hayek, especially if we're like disbarred. If, if for some reason we've run afoul of the bonding commission and uh, we got a call one day from a guy who found out and said, hey, I don't care that you don't have your license anymore. If you still have guns and are willing to jump behind clan lines, I have money. That's going to be an interesting question we're going to want to come back to here just a little bit down is did you guys, are you guys actually... Do you have black marks on your record, or have you just been hired off the books? You know, so there, obviously there's going to be a distinction there. We'll, we'll come back to that. I would actually... Okay. okay. Oh, no, go ahead. If, if you've got thoughts, go ahead. I've, I have one thing on it that uh, it might be a little mix of this and that. Um, this unit might have been put together by whoever the wealthy patron was, and so it is a combination of there might be a couple of legitimate guys who have done shady things in their past. And maybe they're seeking atonement or something, or that could be a plot hook or a thread. But perhaps not everybody in the unit is. And it's one of those kind of ideas like the French Foreign Legion. All kinds of people yeah. come, but you're a different person now that you're in the Legion. So how did your characters first meet? Were you a unit of some kind before this, or were you basically all hired together and assembled one by one by this guy's... I don't know, whoever it is you would have head hunting. Oh, now I've gone from a girl and her bear to a man and his cat. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty! That is a good I, question. That one could also be a bit of both. There could be some people, there could be two or three of us who were in one unit or another, or there could be... Um, it could be all assembled. I have a background in, in mind for my character um, as a mercenary from a unit that got um, partially destroyed and so somewhat scattered. And um, there would be welcome for some other people to, to have been in that mercenary unit with me. Um, so that's also possible. But that, that would uh, allow for... Um, also wild um, variances in characters from different backgrounds or whatnot to still be assembled. You know, I like the idea of having been a free Rasal Hague Republic regular who was given a lawful order to surrender and instead submerged and drove off to Argentina. So, like, no legal status whatsoever. Well, there, you'd have a great opportunity to do that because Rasal FRR's capital world, Rasal Hague itself... Uh, was captured by the by the ghost bears. No, it was captured, but that was the one. Oh, the wolves. It was, was captured by Clan Wolf without a shot being fired. The uh, the governor of the plan, uh, the the leader, was basically uh, in one of Stackpole's uh, Mary Sue oh, moments. Uh, that was that was Radstad. Oh, that was Rodstadt. Okay, so that, was, that wasn't that was like, okay. So uh, Rodstadt, which was one of their major worlds, they knew it was going to be a nightmare to take. And so they, uh, Clan Wolf bit only one person and sent uh, good old Phelan Kell down uh, to convince them to basically surrender the planet peaceably for the sake of the people living there and blah, blah, blah. And I could see that really pissing you off. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if my whole unit walked or maybe just a couple of them. Uh, or maybe even somebody higher up who was not pleased about this decision was like, well, if we can't draw the blood here, let's draw it elsewhere. Yeah. I was, Obviously, uh, we no longer exist as a unit of the FRR, but our mechs are still here. I'm looking at the plot for Curita. Their home planet is Luthien, which was invaded in 3052. I'm not seeing any on how successful it was. It failed. Uh, that, it failed. It failed. It uh, okay. failed on the outskirts of the Imperial City in a valley, uh, in a giant, one of the biggest pitched battles in the Battletech universe. Yeah, I'm yeah. seeing where they first landed, though, was Nagasaki Crane District. I think. Here. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact places, but I can tell you that... Uh, House Curito declined, basically in the interest of saving face, they declined help from the Federated Commonwealth 
and the Federated Commonwealth then contracted on their behalf several mercenary companies that backed them up, and House Curita did successfully defend their capital world. Okay. Um... Say well, it was still a war on the planet, and oh, it probably yeah. it probably wasn't pretty. No, it wasn't. Uh, if if you don't need to pick the capital world, you still want to be a Karedan of Karedan origin. There were many other worlds taken by the Smoke Jaguars and Nova Cats during the initial clan invasion, and that could have taken place on any one of a number of them. That might be better. Um, yeah. Um, so pick a planet that was taken over, and that meant there, because my planet was kind of let go, but the Imperial was saved, um... That's, yeah, you could do that, because there were, um, like, there were strategic retreats to reinforce more important worlds, trading planets for time, um... And so that could have happened to one of the planets uh, further out towards the periphery very easily. Yeah, I mean, is there another reason besides resentment that I would essentially not relocate? Because the way I'm going to build this guy is he's going to be a little older. Not, like, ancient, but he's going to be, like, 40. He's going to have, like, a wife and child that's alive and well. They didn't die tragically. They're somewhere. Um... But he's busy doing shit with these pirates, and he lost his homeworld in uh, the Imperial City, repelled, so, or direction I would take just some, that's where I'm kind of hitting my roadblock. Like, why would that become a pirate? Um, it's well, a chance to strike back at the clans immediately. Yeah, Instead I mean, of having to wait, you can go right now. Also, keep in mind that it's very, very. It's an honor bound society. You may be doing this simply because you were told to do it. That they picked you out for whatever reason and said, "We want you to do this." Um, I guess think of it kind of as you know, if you can't be the samurai, be the shinobi. Yeah. Or um, or even the Ronin. Um, I like the sound of that. Um, and if you want to think up a side, like, a group that, like, because the, the Curita can't officially declare, like, retaliation, I guess, or something, because there's some kind of truce. Oh, they can. Yeah, they can attack the clans all they want. Yeah. All right, but the, okay, but if they did so in a concentrated group effort, maybe that would upset something. Well, I, attacking in mass, of course, requires risking military forces in mass. Uh, it also requires potentially degarrisoning some place to move an army. So versus I'm, sending a handful of people out to piss around, cause trouble. Yeah, exactly. They're spoiling attacks. Yeah, exactly. All right, so, Mark, what are your early thoughts on a character concept? Um, I don't really have... Well, no, I, I did have a couple potential ideas in mind of characters that would interest me. Um, I guess I kind of... Because the game is very vehicle centric almost like your your mech defines your your playstyle and almost your kind of personality the relationship between the mech warrior and the mech right is that accurate it could it, it depends on where you have to. yeah because in many cases those mechs were passed down generationally uh yeah. and so this is not something that you it may not now you you may have it could have been given to you as a gift uh it mm-hmm. could have been purchased out of pocket it's rare but it happens uh, it's also possible this has been in your family for a very long time, and the only reason you have it is because Daddy got too old or too dead to pilot it anymore. Okay, so just coming from this, um, in general, I liked the... I found the faster, more maneuverable mechs more interesting to me from a from a play style. Um, so I thought of one particular kind of character was one who acts as... Uh, 
like in a, the the advanced scout or the or the spotter mech for the lance. Like, um, there's a be able to do recon. There was a mech that has like uh, an electronic warfare suite. The Raven. Yep, that the, one. Yeah, so the Raven has it. The some of the Oscar variants have it. Yep. Raven was what I was thinking of. Uh, also, make you sure you pack tag because I love artillery. <laughs> yep, uh, that, that's what I used it for. Is uh, a spotter for artillery. So, but uh, from a, a more a more well rounded kind of character idea, I thought was actually somebody who Dan, you mentioned like some a mech that was inherited down the line. So, if I was some sort of, um, I was almost thinking. Someone who was kind of far down in the line of importance, you know, whatever, like the third or the fourth or the fifth son of of a household who's who's kind of gotten the the short end of the stick, and he's now inherited kind of the the family legacy mech, which is um, has a lot of idiosyncrasies to it, right? And uh, to have a character who he's had to he's had to maintain it. Almost uh, by hand himself a lot um, because he hasn't been able to uh, afford uh, someone else to. So he's kind of stuck with this his lot in life now, having uh, working with uh, some substandard equipment. And I just had this interesting image, you know, of like a mech that you know doesn't start right unless you you kick it in this spot just properly, and and then okay, now now it goes. But you know, uh, oh, yeah. it may not look that good, is perfect. But I know that. And yeah. so you basically want to drive the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> kind of, in mech form. <laughs> it's like, the mech may not look pretty, but I know it like the back of my she's hand. She's got it where it counts. <laughs> yeah, she's got it where it counts, kind of a thing. Um, okay, uh, that we can certainly work with that. I do have one request, because right now we've got George's Curtain, um, Chris's ex Merc, John is for Saul Haig. I would love to at least have two of you linked together. Mark, in terms of background, would you be willing to have your character have been in the same unit or same organization as one of those three? Um, yep, no problems there. Do you have any preference between them? Uh, Furious All Hate Republic, um, think uh, if you played... Did you play Skyrim? Nope. Oh, uh... Think kind of a uh, high you Nordic. More ways. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Th think high Nordic culture. Um, non cartoonish Vikings sort of thing. Okay, uh, yeah. Chris is Merc. I don't know if you've actually picked the mercenary company or if it's going to be a uh, personal creation mercenary. Uh, I would push towards the personal creation that I messaged you about for this particular concept. I wasn't sure if that would pan out, but if you would allow it, I would go for that. Doesn't, but I talked to you about that already. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, and then uh, George then is Curtin. Uh, think uh, feudal Japan. Right. Although I would also point out, getting that George's character is older, that could be his origin story or whatnot, and he could have ended up in my mercenary company, the one that I came from, um, and then, you know, just has tagged along or has, you know, also survived that. So he's a long-term survivor of several uh, attempts to get back at the clans. And, uh... Yeah. Because, and like, another the... Thing to consider... Oh, go ahead. Another thing to consider is that the the entire nation of any given inner sphere population isn't all ethnically the same as the ruling house. So the Curitans have an imperial Japanese family. The Rasal Hague's government is Norwegian, but that doesn't mean everyone is that. You could be a Japanese person from a Rasal mm -hmm. territory. There are some broad strokes about where different ethnicities of the earth like uh, colonized during the expansion of the Terran hegemony. But yes, roughly speaking, there is a little bit of everybody everywhere. Although there's like flavor to some of the great houses, just because of the regions of space that various nations tended to colonize during expansion. Okay, so John, give me the quick recap. Your FRRX military? That's right. So the FRR 
of the main inner sphere powers was the smallest one to begin with on the eve of the clan invasion. And by the end of it, they were devastated. The, the line as it stopped when the main clan push sputtered out, or was rather stopped by truce, took almost all of the FRR's territory. So all but seven planets. Yeah, so what I'm going with is somebody whose planet surrendered behind him while he wasn't there and who did not comply with his order to turn around and turn in his military assets, who just buzzed off and found someone who's going to cut him a check and pay for the gas and the, and the new uh, machine parts to keep fighting against the clan division. John, actually, yep. in order for you to abscond like that, you're going to need people helping you. So I think what I may do to, uh, is, unless anyone objects, is keep running with that. And your guys' base infrastructure uh, are part of his defection. Oh, yeah. No, I had no intention of being, you know, this was just me flapping my wings. Yeah, I'm say, because, sure. yeah, you, you can't exactly... Put you know, it, someone had a drop ship, someone had enough money for a jump ship, and the jump ship captain knew him. All this was there together. Yeah, well, I'm wondering if even maybe the way I go with this is uh, there was a like something like a uh, scout class jump ship with a small drop ship on it and your unit, and all of them were like, screw this, we're not giving up this easily. And... You know, some people stayed, some people left. There was, you know, divisions and schisms, but what was left was enough to sort of abscond off on their own. Just yeah, go and off. Mark, you could have been anywhere in that organization. Yeah, so I, I like the the FRR. So, yeah, what I'm thinking with this character is I like the idea that he's like third or fourth in line of a minor noble or rich house or whatever in a small household out on the periphery so he's very much he's stuck with his lot in life and is trying to make the best of it um i don't actually see him as a particularly disciplined person like military life wouldn't have suited him super well but he certainly could have done it because he was expected to or supposed to. It just didn't have another choice. So when the ability, the opportunity to cut and run, when it all fell apart, he wouldn't have had a problem with. So um, maybe your character, my character, could have struck up a, a friendship in when we were serving together. And um, when this opportunity came up, yeah, we both cut and run, cut our losses yeah. and head off together. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, there may have been a fight. Uh, maybe not necessarily lethal, may not have necessarily scorched earth, but uh, I'm sure somebody on our dropship wanted to comply with the order and go back home, and you and I may have had our backs together at the walls at some point and pulled through for each other. Okay, and so go ahead. Yeah, I can see my character definitely saying, like, what have I got to go home to? <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Okay, so the two of you served together in the FRR and were part of the same uh, leaving. Uh, and then Chris and George, it sounds like you guys are going to simply have been hired in uh, by whoever this benefactor is uh, to f as part of the effort to fill, refill out the ranks that were either lost in battle or just didn't join the uh, absconding if that works for you guys. Yeah, um, if I went with the honor-bound route, there might have been a connection between the wealthy guy and someone in the Combine, such that we see you're looking for... They might have an arrangement. Uh, that's one idea. Uh, looks it's possible, but that'd be kind of weird. The the Rasselhagians did not have a great deal of love for the Koreans. Well, whoever the benefactor may not be Razzlehag. True. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking the benefactor is probably going to be somebody fairly independent. Um, a major event shared in the past. Now, some of that's character levels or anything, because like. John and Mark, you two are going to have some shared personal events. Uh, is there anything group level, or do you want like do you want this game to start when you guys have already done a couple of these runs, 
Or do you want this game to start when, like, you're on your first run? I I always find that the, there's a bit of awkwardness to the you guys are literally meeting for the first time in a tavern kind of thing. No, let's definitely not do meeting in the first time in a tavern. I would say let's do it Star Wars style and, and start with the retro rockets firing when we're about to land on mission number four or something like that. Okay, so you've done a couple of these outings. We don't need to define them yet. Uh, we can define them mid-game, but there have been... This is not your first run. And maybe up we to could, this point... Go ahead. We could sketch out at least one galvanizing encounter with maybe some some rough points that we can all refer back to, and that can serve as a, as a jumping-off point for some of those in-character discussions that I've mentioned before. Yes, those I, those rem- remember when points. I totally 100% support that. Uh, and also uh, I think something else we could do with this is uh, maybe these were something to the effect of dry runs or uh, C-tests on the group. So basically give you guys smaller, simpler raids or operations before they yeah. give you a big one of, okay, this is where you're really going off radar. And even if we want to, we could each of us write like a two paragraph long squib short story about an operation that we've done already. Just something small time. If we're going to assume that the curtain doesn't rise on all of us meeting for the first time and going out on our first trip. Okay. On a personal level, what keeps the characters together? Obviously shared... Uh, hate of the clans or shared dislike whatever word you want to use there of the clans is one thing um, is there anything else that keeps you guys together are you all equally curious about what's out there um, equally adventurous is there uh, I mean I know of course Mark and John's character know each other I uh, yeah, I would say my character and my character have pre-existing military bonds that have continued on into our current role. Uh, George, we have a basis for a love-hate relationship because you're Cretan and I'm the Rasal Hag. Yeah, uh, but we definitely should make it deeper than that. We should John, have gone to I Rival actually schools. have like a, I have um an angle that you guys might know my character as well. Um, Rasal Hag uh, did not really use mercenaries much, but their corporations did. It is entirely possible that a company from the mercenary unit I came from was under contract to guard something or do something on one of the worlds that got hit. Um, the survivors ended up getting um, picked up by a military dropship, like perhaps the one you guys were on that had extra space because you'd also taken losses. And as you're retreating and eventually get the word to surrender, the mercenaries, a couple of us just happened to be along as well. So yeah, that, I like that a lot, especially because the Rasal Hague government can't tell you where to park your dropship. So if we want to walk and go with you, uh, that, that could be a part of the defection that occurred in the aftermath of the surrender. But yeah, it's a, the company-level unit got smashed pretty hard by one of the clans, and um, the survivors ended up getting uh, collecting up with Rasal Hague survivors from uh, House Unit. And uh, because <laughs> when everyone's trying to get off of the planet, they're not stopping to wonder who's, as long as you're an inner sphere unit, you're allowed to go. Yeah, in, <laughs> in the moment of uh, clan encirclement, the precise nature of your enlistment terms is no longer quite that important. Although if you watch Dunkirk, it actually was. All the French soldiers obviously hated the British soldiers because they got to leave. Uh, let's see, is there enough, I don't think this is going to be an issue, but I'm just going to ask, is there enough moral agreement among the characters to keep them from abhorring each other? It doesn't sound like a problem. Yeah, I don't think I don't, that's I've not heard anyone say anything. I'm like, wow, this guy's going to be the asshole. Uh, da, da, da. Is there any potential conflict between character personalities, goals, or ethics that could become so great the plot will fizzle out, or players will be excluded? I see one, and only one. Which is, George, so far you are the only person not connected by history to the rest of them. Um, and especially given the fact that you're a Curtin, 
which has a negative history with both Rasal Haig and Mercenaries. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we need to do something to get you in here. Um, some, well, some kind of connection to... There is a way, and that is if... This is drawing again from the fiction, but especially if the um, the benefactor could be, um, if it's Cretan descent or whatnot, or could be an eccentric of some other place, but quite often we'll have like someone sent along to look after their interests. That could be an NPC, or we could say it's George. I'm 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 reaching here for trying to get him an in, um, but he could be somebody who I comes could- along as a condition of the support. I could have flown right to the idea that strikes me just now is instead of me become being an honor bound pirate, everyone else seems to have some black in their ledger. Uh, I could join that theme no, feeling the loss of my home world on the outskirts of the Combine. Uh, there's the stalemate with the clans, not giving enough action, so I impatiently just kind of... Uh, I could be some kind of contact for the... For the I might have flo- I might have ha- just happened to know a guy who was the benefactor, like this aristocratic whoever. Maybe I flew right for him. Like, said goodbye to the wife, said goodbye to the kid, and just flew right there. Okay. As soon as, like, the stalemate kind of shows signs of progressing, and I'm just, like, watching my home world while everyone's... Yeah, I mean, you could, you could be a Bushido psycho who stayed in Polulu until 1962. I mean, that, that is definitely a potential source of inspiration for why you're doing what you're doing. The only thing I'm wondering is, is, does, is it a good fit for the group template? Is that, I mean, because this guy is kind of nuts. Do we keep him around because he's useful and he amuses us? Or I, I think right. we, would, we would need some sort of stronger bonding agent than just our employer told us we have to take him or he's, or he's watching or he's sent here to watch us. Um, it could have been on one of our early... In one of our early encounters, maybe you came in unexpectedly and did something particularly impressive to earn our trust and respect. Yeah. Maybe the battle that we were committed to happened to be within radar range of the cave you had sworn to die in fighting. And when the fight started, you just came out. And, like, started shooting Clan Max and didn't know who we were, and we didn't know who you were. But uh, it was a really special relationship. Yeah. Sure, we were, we were fighting on some world that's supposed to be deserted, or that we assume that the Cretans gave up on, and we got into a rough spot, and then suddenly behind our enemies, this random mech with Karita markings suddenly started blasting people in the rear armor. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Like random lone mech samurai type dude, yep. crazy. Yeah. That you may have sallied forth, in. thinking, "Okay, great. This is this is when I die. This is my chance." And then we won. And it was like, "Oh, <laughs> now <Okay>. what?" <laughs> and then uh, you opportunity to hail my calm and be like, "We're getting out of here." And then I'm kind of like, "No, I'm going to defend my stupid ice cave." Then you guys kind of were like, no, that's dumb, come with us. Because you can do a lot more for everyone. You, like, you know. Appeal yep. to your sense of duty. That's right. Also, we could have lost our fourth in that combat and been like, hey, dude, we need to fill out the lance. Oh, I like that one. Yeah. Well, I think it'd also be interesting if you guys or I can do it if you want. But I, th- I think more so if you guys did it, or the three of you, uh, Mark, Chris, and John, designed that fourth person uh, yeah. to give you a particular person to miss and give them traits that you miss. Um, so this is not just generic, 
you know, friend who has a name but never appears on screen. But this is somebody that you can actually yeah. point to facts the only, about. The or... only other survivor from my mercy company. I was just going to say that, Christopher. This could have been like what Mark and I are to one another. This person could have been to you, and and we lost him or her. No, yeah. So I definitely went rogue. Um, that's how we're going to play it. Like, I just got in the ship, got, like, landed on a planet with my mech, and just went nuts. Okay. Um, just as long as you're not too nuts now, because... Oh, no, he's... Dangerous. In some ways, he's the most sane of all of you. Um, hey! It's... <laughs> from perspective. George, how would you feel, and I'm just thinking about this, as a way... I could also kind of draw this all together that the benefactor is also your mentor. He's maybe not your actual father, but he's been a father figure to you for like a long time. And like he maybe like even sponsored you into the academy. You go off, get trapped in your cave on some Pacific island or whatever happens. Mm hmm come out with these guys, and when he finds out what's going on, he then gets involved. But he's, I guess he's kind of, I don't want to oversimplify this or stereotype, but he's kind of like your splinter. Uh, he doesn't necessarily do anything with you guys because he's just getting too up there in years. But he wholly believes in it, and he's kind of your sanity check. Um, he's, he's the guy that get, kind of reels you in a bit. Okay, yeah. No, because we almost do have a Ninja Turtle theme because there's the Leonardo and Raphael dynamic, and then you can have a Splinter dynamic being like, you shouldn't fight. <laughs> That'd also be great. So, uh, next, qu you know what? This is also always good. This is going to be an amusing one. Uh, Chris, do you know the rules well enough off the top of your head? Because I'll admit I did not get a time of war studied up on prior to this. Uh, do you feel you're comfortable enough with the rules to do character creation now, or would you rather come back and do that next time? I could do character creation, but it is relatively involved because of the life path system. Okay, then I tell you what, let's hold that off then until next time. Um, and we'll come back and do it then of the, because, yeah, I don't want to... It's already what, almost 10 o'clock here, so I don't want to keep this running all night. So uh, now that we've gotten our technical hurdles worked out and some basic uh, intro stuff done, uh, then we will, we've got everything we need. So next time we can come back and do uh, character creation, and then also I can start describing for you the assets that your group has. Uh, one thing I'll ask you guys now, and you can tell me you want to defer this to character creation or decide it now, because I think now would be a great time over the next two weeks before we meet again for you guys to start working on those plot hooks, both individually and the things that you share as a group. Uh, and one of the things that kind of matters, because it has to come out of this, is what the ranks are. Um, if you're within a lance, I'd like one of you to be the officer, one to be the XO, and... To you to be the mech warriors. Do you guys Can want I to bring a penguin from my ice cave? Sure. It, it, it's dead. It's been dead for years. Hey. <laughs> You've taxidermied it into a puppet. Okay. It's the only friend he has. Anyone raising their hands? Anyone wanting command? I don't care. I can take it or leave it. I think I had it last time. All right, here's what we're going to do. All four of you roll 2d6. Uh, for anyone doesn't know, do you guys all know if it's slash roll space 2d6 on the... Uh, yeah. So everybody roll 2d6. The top down from numbers, this is going to be the order of command. I, I would say that anybody, uh, just given the character concepts, John, uh, me, or Mark should be uh, the commander. George probably is not, given um, the character and the way we... Uh, we describe that. 
Let me see uh, the roll, because he, he, I, I would still consider giving him an exo slot. So let me see, let me see the roll. So John's got a ten. Chris has got a six. Mark's got a six. George has a five. Uh, Chris and Mark, can I get you guys to roll again to tie break? Okay, so John, you are the officer. We're gonna make you an LT. Cool. Uh, Mark, if you feel comfortable doing it, you are gonna be his XO. That seems to make sense. And then uh, Chris and George, whatever your uh, prior ranks were, uh, you are now. Uh, I'll pick the exact ranks later, but you two will be of a functionally equal rank. Uh, and then also you will have other... I am going to give you additional support assets. So I'm probably, for example, going to give you a helicopter or two, a salvage vehicle, probably some infantry. So you are going to have under, other assets under the broad umbrella of command. So... Uh, None of you will end up being the total bottom of the totem pole, so don't don't worry about that. Because the stereotypes kind of work well, John, if your character is more of the slightly more to the, the stereotypical commander, kind of the hard ass, I definitely see my guy as the the more per personable XO kind of a thing, the the likable one. Yeah, I can I can roll with that. Uh, my dude definitely had a regimented upbringing well, you know went went to officer school did it all by the numbers probably came from nobility as most people who have next do uh, <clears throat> and was sufficiently motivated enough on a personal level to throw out the order of surrender and fly off to keep fighting so you know what? work for me let's do one more thing we can do while we got the time here I'm not guaranteeing this because uh, I want to look over some unit composition stuff before I make a final call. But let's let's do one little exercise here, so I'll at least give you guys a pick that I'll try to go for, just for fun. Uh, two things. What mech and how did you get it? Point of order. Um, George is leading towards that Hunchback 2C. That is a clan tech design. He does not have a Hunchback 2C. George does not have a Hunchback 2C. <laughs> All right. The hunchback you say is a meme. It's not even. Yeah, it's a running inside joke. He's been dumping hunchback two C minis into my D and D games for ten. Can, can I have a hunchback two C? Is George's? Can I have a Waymec? It, yeah. It's it's his. Ah. <laughs> so no, George does not have a hunchback two C. Fair enough. Uh, being as we're, how much we're going to be raiding the clans, though. It is entirely possible we may end up with clan equipment itself. Oh, right, I, and I'm not... That's in-game stuff. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to take away anything you guys earn from you. If George gets his hands on a Hunchback 2C, he has a Hunchback 2C now. The, this, has now become, this has become a meta goal for the campaign. <laughs> he has got to get one at this point. My goal, my meta goal as a Game Master will be to give him a Hunchback 2C and take it away from him in record time. <laughs> you don't have to take it away. I will lose it. Dan, what's the uh, what's the menu? What what kind of list are, are we going after? Uh, let's start with anything book standard or book variant. Uh, you, it's probably going to be anything in terms of technical manual thirty fifty and back. Uh, you might have a thirty fifty thirty fifty five mech, excuse me, but that's definitely going to be a new handout. Um, Is so, there anywhere like online where the thirty fifty mechs are listed? Uh, yeah, actually, the thing that I linked, the uh, master unit list. Yeah, you can sort oh, by year of introduction. Um, oh man, there's a lot of good choices. Yeah, I've, I put that up in. Uh, well, I'm just kidding. We don't have to pick this now. I'm just curious. Does anyone have? I really, really want to have my blank, whatever blank is. Nah. I'm probably going to be going on the heavy end since I'm the LT, but within that, I don't, I don't have any strong references. I was thinking something quicker. Uh, so I would recommend going generally towards the more mobile end because you are not going to win a punching match with a clan mech. To fit my character... To fit my character design, I just need something ancient. 
a, an old and venerable design. Oh, there's no shortage of those. Something Star League. Something fast uh, and Star honestly, League. Honestly, the first thing that came to my mind was Phoenix Hawk. Uh, Phoenix Hawk would work if you want another venerable design. It was originally retired, but I think they brought it back. They being the companies that make Battletech, not not the in-game history, uh, to fill in some holes in the mech rosters during the legal fights with Harmony Gold is the Hussar. The only problem with the Hussar is it has tissue paper for armor. We're talking one or two points in several of the locations. Does it really? I thought I, I remember the cicada being that bad. The PPC cicada, but I thought the Hussar no, the, was a the, little the bit better off. The Hussar, uh, yeah, the... Um, the 325 version is a little better because they had to downgrade the laser from an ER large to a standard ER, or a standard large laser. So that actually allowed them to up armor it slightly. But especially the Star League version with the ER large laser is one or two points of armor on the arms and torsos. What about two other designs I was thinking about if you want something old? Is What about, uh, did they do revisions on the Mongoose? And what was the Star League headhunting mech? Uh, exterminator. The, the, was that the one with the four meds and the LRM-10? Yes. So that was actually designed... That was actually a 65-ton mech. Um, but it's a 65-ton mech that can move 6-9 with the XL version. Yeah, it was and, It was designed to hunt to chase down larger mechs. Yeah, it was intended specifically to attack command, command mechs. Uh, because the original, the, Star, the Royal version had the null six and the uh, chameleon system. Okay, well, sounds like nobody's got a strong, damn, I really need my marauder or whatever, so we will punt on this, and this is something you guys can work on next time. So what we'll do is we will pick up the next episode of this in two weeks. If you want to catch the Twitch stream, it'll be around, uh, give us some time for technical issues, so maybe 7.30 Central uh, on Monday, the what will that be? The twenty fifth, I think. And uh, between now and then, you guys are going to get me some plot hooks individually, some shared background, and we will come in next time ready to actually put pen to paper, get these characters made, and we'll see where we go from there. And hey, be shopping. Um, before you wrap up, this we did have a couple of people in the chat, and I want to give some shout out. Um, oh, Church please do. Spammy V, um, talking about. Uh, you guys are going Rasselhag and don't lose immediately. Um, talking about, yeah, a lot of real Mary Sue stuff there. Don't know what that was talking about. Uh, what's That's his probably my dig it for you, Lamb. That's uh, 100% Bondsman to anti clan insurgents. Can't even pull him away, it comes to mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ragnar Magnuson, uh, spammy views, who you're referring to. Uh, Church Trinblade says, hey, Raven! So he's talking about that. Um, can confirm a time of war is involved. Yep, certainly can. And also a uh, shout out for Victor, uh, the 80 ton assault mech with either AC 20 or Goss rifle. But that's uh, also uh, 464 on the Victor's move profile. So that's uh, on the heavy end yeah, and four. relatively slow. John, you totally want a charger. I totally do not want a charger. 585, 585. I would, five I would take a Victor. I would take a <laughs> Zeus. I would take a Black Knight. I would take a Marauder. I would take a Flashman. You know, if we're if we're gonna run in that like seventy five ton range, Flashman's for, a for good the mech. Command Actually, yeah, I was gonna say Flashman. Great mech. It's a five eight, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's actually and uh, all energy weapons, so it does really well without a uh, resupply. Flashman's actually that's a good pick. Alright, I'm taking Flashman. You can shop through the variants. I, do I just recommend- need a little, like, rubber kiddie pool to stand in while I shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and I do recommend actually looking at the stats in case we do end up switching back to regular battle tech so you're not stuck with a mech that looks that works well in Alpha Strike, but in the details of battle tech would actually get turn to crap. So, And you guys will have some opportunities to do some custom mods on your mech as the game progresses. But, What's a good, like, faster, slightly higher tonnage? 
like faster mid tonnage skirmisher, not like long range, something that well, especially as a Curitan, there's two I would recommend. Uh, the Kentaro and the Crab. The Dragon also fits into the... Oh, the Dragon, yeah. Crash. How did I blank out on the Dragon? Or more more accurately, it's it's uh, Cousin, the Grand Dragon. Okay. That's what you have me here for. Thank you. I don't know why I'm <laughs> thinking about Curitan Skirmishers are blanked on the Grand Dragon. That's a really, that's a nice mech. Uh, the Grand Dragon, uh, the Wolf Trap is another one. Uh, that would fit your bill. Uh, the Chertons have a really nice variant of the Shadowhawk that uh, it's, I think, AC5 and a PPC. Yeah, uh, the 2K. They have, uh, uh, like I said, I already mentioned the Crab. There's the Kentaro, and that has a few uh, variants that you can look at. Those are both pretty decent skirmishers. Um you want something that can really wade in and just especially a whale on infantry, the Komodo, uh, came out around this time, and the Komodo would be like something new that would be given to you, but it was intended as an elemental hunter, so it has like six medium lasers and a couple of anti-missile systems on it, and it's fast. And what was that called? That's the K- the KM2 Komodo. Yes. It's uh, light medium, I believe it's 40 tons, but I'd have to double check. Yeah, given where you guys are, I'll grant just about anything from 2750, 3025, 3050, or 3055. Though 3055, I'd want a story on where that came from. Okay, anything else? A lot of sheets to look through. Good to go, bro. We got two weeks. So, alrighty then. Uh, you guys at home have a great week and all that stuff. Uh, for anyone that wants the audio version, I might be getting this a day or two late because I need to get this posted and then scrape the audio. Uh, but as for us, you guys, thanks for tuning in, and we will catch you guys in a couple weeks. See ya. Take care, all. <laughs>